Hello and welcome to the Hopkins Hangout Hour for Friday, September 4th. Our team is out on assignments today and we'll be off on Monday for the Labor Day holiday. So today we'll revisit our conversation that we had last week with Athletic Director Rich Cormier at the high school as he updates on us on all the latest developments with the COVID in fall sports. On Monday, we'll replay our show on nature photography with our guests John Ritz and Andrew Cousins. We'll look at some of their photos, as well as photos that were submitted by you, our viewers. Hopkins Hangout Hour will be alive again on Tuesday with an update from our superintendent, Dr. Kavanaugh, uh, as they get ready to open up schools on the 16th. Uh, Wednesday, we'll see what's up with the women's club. And Thursday, we'll have Shauna Casey back to give us an update on everything going on COVID as the town just got to zero cases, which is outstanding. And on Friday, Tom and I will be talking sports again with uh, Jerry Keene and Andy Barron. So sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. Tom Nappy here, and joining me is my co-host, Mike Tarosian, and we also have Hopkinton High School Athletic Director, Rich Cormier. Mike and Rich, how you guys doing? Doing great, Tom. Doing fantastic. Doing, doing well, Tom. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. There's a lot to talk about. We had the uh, fall guidelines just come out, mm -hmm. um, and we have sport by sport guidelines, and there's all kinds of uh, differences from what uh, MIA sports would be, I guess, if things were normal. <laughs> yeah. But um, I'm sure you must uh, be a pretty busy guy right now. I'd imagine since we for the most part, know what sports are taking place in the fall season. I'd imagine uh, you're starting to get involved with the uh, scheduling process. Yeah, you know, it's absolutely, things have gotten much, much busier um, after we were kind of just lying in wait for, for quite some time. But uh, I'm certainly not going to complain. Um, you know, after what happened this past spring, I'm just excited to have the opportunity to provide you know, an athletic experience for our students. So we definitely have some hurdles to jump through. Uh, for, there's no question about that with some, some new ones thrown our way about an hour ago um, that I have not even fully had a chance to read through, process, or digest yet. So uh, that'll be a fun weekend project uh, for me. But, um, you know, again, you know, whatever we can do to give our students an opportunity, but, you know, first and foremost, to make sure that opportunity is safe, uh, you know, for all of them. So, you know, just happy to have the chance, really. Absolutely. And we're happy to see uh, sports coming back again. And it may not be the traditional style we are used to, but it's certainly exciting to have high school athletics coming back again uh, after not having a season in the spring. Uh, so we will uh, get into the details about the changes that were made with the new COVID-19 regulations for MIA sports. Uh, but first off, I, I just was wondering if you could talk about the process a little bit and the planning that was involved in coming up with this uh, final draft of the plan that was uh, just released. Uh, how involved were you in the planning process? So um, it varied a little bit uh, depending on what committees and groups uh, that you may belong to. Um, so there are so if you go back to this kind of this summer, you know, from the spring into the summer, we, we really as a group of athletic directors have started to started to meet over the summer um, and just kind of talk about what the fall might look like. We talked about all sorts of different contingencies, um, but we really couldn't do any planning. Um, you know, uh, I have to say the work that the MIAA COVID task force did was was amazing. It really was. I mean, you certainly can poke holes in things or criticize things. Um, there's no perfect situation here. Um, but I think they worked really, really hard to make sure that we were able to have sports, whether you were remote, whether you were hybrid, whether you were fully back in person. They really wanted to make this uh, a key part of the return to school plan. Um, and although it was tough to wait, you know, we kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And I know families have been waiting and waiting, but you know, in some ways it's better to be patient and try to get it right rather than to keep changing it over and over and over again, which unfortunately we've seen with some other states, you know, they came out with plans um, and then they had to constantly adjust those plans. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely some, some benefits to waiting uh, as hard as it can be. Um, then uh, at this point was about a, 
about a week and a half ago. Um, those initial um, information came out um, from the EEA, the government uh, agency that, that tells us kind of what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. Um, and then um, DESE and the COVID task force met uh, to come up with a plan based on those guidelines. And then as you guys probably know, the board of directors then met um, and sort of ratified those, which is somewhat of a formality, but certainly led to some more conversation. From that meeting, um, we were then able as a league to begin moving forward. You know, at that point, we knew we were not able to play football. We knew we were not able to offer unified basketball uh, or cheer, and that those would be moved to that newly created uh, sort of fall two season, as we're calling it, uh, mm -hmm. in late February. But there was still uh, a major hurdle that we've been kind of waiting for, which was these sport modifications. So although we knew we might be able to play soccer or we might be able to play field hockey, we really needed to see what was going to work for each of our individual communities uh, as well as a league. Uh, you know, one of the recommendations was to play a league geographic schedule. Um, so we really needed to be united as much as possible as a league or we wouldn't have really had any contest to play. Um, so it was very important that we were, you know, devising a plan as a league, but then also one that that fits for what we need here in Hopkinton. Um, and then we've kind of done that. Um, we, we feel like we're in a pretty good place. Um, I'll be presenting more to the community next week at the school committee meeting of kind of what our plan uh, looks like for this fall uh, with more details than I have right now. Um, and a big part of that will be these modifications that I have. And if you know, if you print, I mean, it's about 20 pages uh, <laughs> of, of things that we need to go through. Uh, some of them are general modifications that apply to everything. Uh, and then some are sports specific modifications. So uh, we still have some work ahead of us uh, for sure. Um, but again, like I said at the beginning, I don't think you're going to find an athletic director that that's complaining about this right now. We're just happy to have athletics back and to have these opportunities for our for our students and our communities. And I'm sure it's a lot of uh, planning on your part and a lot of work on your part as well uh, to plan for the uh, individual season. Uh, so do you have any idea of what the schedule is going to look like? Is it going to be all TVL? Is it going to be mostly TVL? And from what I've heard, I understand there's not going to be a state tournament. Right. So in that board of directors meeting, the MIAA um, did cancel the postseason for uh, the fall one season, and they're going to revisit whether we can have a postseason tournament for the other seasons, you know, depending on the situation. Um, so in some ways, that's disappointing. Obviously, students who have been waiting their high school careers to get to be the senior and the leader on their team and take their team to the playoffs and take their team to maybe, a, you know, a championship, you know, that's obviously a huge disappointment um, for those students, much like it not having a season was last spring. Um, so there's no doubt it's a, it's a disappointment. Um, but I think we really need to reframe how we're looking at high school athletics um, this year. It is really going to be about participation and opportunities. It's not going to be about winning. It's not going to be about championships. It's really going to be about getting, getting these kids back out on their, their respective teams, with their teammates, with their coaches uh, in a safe manner. So by getting rid of the postseason, as disappointing as that is, it does free us up as schools and leagues to get a little bit more creative because we're not worrying about, you know, loading up our schedule so that we're ready for the tournament or um, having to play so many games or not enough games or, you know, those types of limitations were taken off the table. So for us as a league, we were then able to devise what was going to be the safest plan possible. You know, we're not worried about, um, who's beating who, who's losing to who, all those things. We're really just trying to, to get, get these games going again. Um, and so that did free us up a little bit. Um, so to answer your, your direct question, we are looking at, again, nothing's been approved yet, um, but we are planning to move with like sort of a, a geographic breakdown of the TVL, um, where we would only play a, a handful of TVL schools based on, again, kind of breaking the league into geographic groups, uh, we would not be playing, you know, non-league games, um, and there'd certainly be no uh, playoffs of any kind, at least for this, you know, for this fall one season. And, and again, you know, as an athletic director, we're always kind of looking ahead to, you know, our winter schedule, for instance, is pretty much done. 
right? Because I had to plan ahead like we were going to have a normal fall, a normal winter, et cetera. And now we'll have to make those adjustments to winter. We're going to have to adjust our spring schedule since we're now not starting the spring season until April 26th. You know, so there's a lot of things that we need to do. But for now, I think if you talk to any athletic director, our focus is on fall one right now and just trying to get this off the ground because given the fluidity of the situation, um, you know, we're just going to have to constantly be flexible, adjust as we go. So, um, you know, right now, I don't want to say I'm not worried about those sports because I am. Many of them are considered high risk sports. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with many of those sports. But um, really, the focus right now is getting this fall one season uh, off and running. And Rich, you're no stranger to adjustment either, because, I mean, you had a, the experience of uh, the lovely Triple E last year. Yeah. And you make all those adjustments and modification. And uh, I'm just wondering. Um, is that still in the back of your mind as this fall season starts? It is. It's a, it's a great question. And, um, you know, I think we learned a lot last year by, by navigating Triple E, you know, again, without really any notice. Um, and then even the spring, which obviously we didn't have a season in the spring. But um, what people may or may not realize is there was still a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. Because if, if you think back, and I know it seems like forever ago, it was not canceled until I don't remember the exact day, but it was late in May by the time they actually canceled things. So we kept rescheduling and redoing everything within our league and creating different schedules that would work if we got to go back and coming up with what a modified playoff might even look like. Um, so we did a lot of this planning last spring, and that has actually now benefited us a little bit um, as we've moved into this season because we already had to think outside the box, even though we weren't able to put it into into action and our coaches as well did an amazing job this past spring uh, much like teachers transitioned to remote learning and did an amazing job keeping kids engaged and, and keeping them educated our coaches in hopkinton I, I was blown away again being new um i never really got the chance to work with our spring coaches you know there's some of them i still don't know all that well because most of our conversations have been like this um and um you know if you remember that that announcement came out um, the day before spring sports were scheduled to start. Uh, it was right. March 15th when we found out that schools were going to be shut down for, at, at first, just a few weeks. And I, our coaches quickly transitioned to, to doing Zooms with their teams, uh, doing workouts over Zoom, holding college informational sessions, doing trivia nights, bringing in guest speakers. I mean, they were unbelievably creative um, and finding ways to keep their teams connected, engaged, to recognize and honor their seniors. And I think some of those lessons that we learned, you know, we can now take take with us. Um, and Triple E is just another one of those, Mike. Um, we, as we've started to devise a plan for this fall, you know, no, um, no community in our league is currently under Triple E restrictions, but it's certainly at the back of our minds. So we did factor that in uh, because as we're starting later, we lose – obviously daylight. Sure. Um, and if we are running into Triple E curfews or anything like that, that could drastically alter, um, you know, how we're able to play games in a safe manner and, and get them done and make sure we have space between groups and, you know, all those things that we now need to consider. Um, so Triple E was, was, even though it may not impact us, it was a, a con big consideration um, in devising the plan that we've, we've kind of put together. It, with as as the COVID uh, situation moves, and as Dr. Kavanaugh has mentioned on her Tuesday updates with us, that you know we're going with a hybrid model now for for learning, and but that could change like that. And how much of that kind of change do you think will affect the sports program? Yeah, I mean certainly we're we're tied right to the school uh, system, and, and although. If a school district did choose to open fully remote, you still are allowed to um, have sports. Um, if, if anyone has noticed recently, Franklin is one of those schools that, that elected to open a year remote. And just a couple nights ago, their school committee voted to allow athletic participation. However, we have not really seen what would happen if a school went from hybrid to remote, right? And what that might mean for us uh, in terms of sports. And I think some of it would have to do with why did we go remote? Um, is it staffing issues? Is there an outbreak? You know, what are the reasons why we had to move remote, um, whether it was more safety or whether it was more logistical, I think might play into whether we're allowed to continue on or not. 
Um, I don't know if that I'm, I'm being very clear there, but right. I think it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion, but likely if we're shutting school down, it's, it might be a little bit tougher to, to continue on with sports. Um, but I'll say a couple things with that. Um, you know, the way I'm looking at it is those things are out of my control, right? COVID in, in particular is out of our control. So we're going to plan and we're going to move forward and, and we're going to do the best we can to make, to make this as safe as possible. Um, and, and on that note, you know, from an athletic standpoint, we want to offer athletic opportunities, but we truly want to do it as safe as possible. We, we do not want to be the reason why schools have to shut their doors. You know, so we want to make sure we're taking every precaution, not only to keep the kids active in athletics, but to keep them active with their academics. Um, and, and that's the most important part. Um, so we're really taking every precaution uh, we can um, to make sure we're able to keep running as long as possible. Um, under the new guidelines as well, and I think this is really relevant, Mike, to your, your question is, let's say we get a week maybe two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is into our athletic season, and we do have to shut it down for whatever reason. We do have the ability under the rules to postpone any sport that we're currently playing at that time, soccer, field, hockey, cross country, to that fall two season. Great. Again, not a great alternative, um, certainly, but it, it's still an opportunity. But it's still an opportunity. It's better than that outright cancellation. Uh, now, again, if there's only maybe like a week left in the season, then we'd probably just call it a season at that point. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, yeah, but yeah. but if we're a few weeks in and we do have to, you know, close up for any reason, um, at least there is that opportunity that if the situation did improve or if there is that vaccine that, you know, obviously is out there and people are talking about, you know, there'd at least be that possibility. Um, the, the other rule that's in place that, that could come into effect, and I know it just recently impacted a few communities um, this past Wednesday, is if we ever move into red on that COVID map, right? athletics has to cease immediately. Um, and that can be tricky um, because it may not have anything to do with the schools, right? Um, exactly. you know, we could have an outbreak in a, in a very, you know, in a you know, piece of the town or in a community uh, that has no bearing uh, on the school. But that is a, an MIA part of that rules that came out between DESE and the MIAA is that if any community moves into the red, um, your sports would cease immediately. Yeah, um, and Hopkins just moved from gray to green mm -hmm. uh, this week. So, right. right. So it's something we'll have to constantly monitor. And it's something we've talked about as a league as well. Um, we actually have, I think, one or two communities in our league that are currently yellow. Um, you know, thankfully, we are not here in Hopkinton, but we're also trying to leave the door open that if a community doesn't want to necessarily take, the, you know, we're scheduled to play somebody, but they're in the yellow and they're teetering, like maybe we don't play you guys because we just don't want to take that risk. So we're, we're trying to leave a lot of um, wiggle room, you know, for schools to do what they think is best for their students um, and to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, you know, as more information comes out, as we, we sort of formal, I don't want to I don't want to say too much because nothing has been formally approved and, and I don't want to add to speculation, um, you know, but as these details become clearer, I, I think people will realize we've put a lot of thought into this in terms of, you know, making sure that we can do contact tracing, you know, what's the best way to do that, you know, when we're, when we're dealing with more than one community at a time. Um, and I think the TVL um, principals and athletic directors, we've met a couple times over the past few weeks. Uh, have really made this at our forefront of how we're going to go about this, um, you know, to make sure it's safe, you know, and again, it's not going to be the same. I think Tom, you said that at the very beginning. I mean, this is going to be drastically different. Uh, there's no doubt about that for sure. And uh, well, for the, yeah, oh, sorry, Mike, but I just wanted to pull this up real quick. So uh, in case there's uh, people out there watching that haven't seen this, this is the plan uh, for the seasons this year. There's a fall season, a winter season, and then there's that floating season that, uh, Rich, you were talking about uh -huh. how if one of those fall sports end up not being able to be played, mm -hmm. uh, it could be postponed to that floating season. And then after that, you would have your spring season. Mm -hmm. uh, but just taking it uh, sport by sport in the fall, you'd have golf, cross country, running, field hockey, soccer, gymnastics. Girls volleyball, fall swimming and diving. Uh, you could have football practice, but the 
actual football season would be in that floating season. And you could have cheer practice and unified basketball practice. And then in the winter, you got your gymnastics, uh, boys and girls, indoor track, ski, dance, uh, winter swimming and diving, cheer, hockey, basketball, and wrestling. And then after that would be the floating season, which right now it doesn't say here, but I believe it's a uh, football cheer and unified basketball uh, as of right now. And then in the spring, it's the typical spring sports. It will start a little later. Uh, golf, baseball, softball, tennis, volleyball, uh, boys volleyball, girls and boys lacrosse and track and field. Uh, and if anyone out there is uh, looking for this information, you can find it all on the MIAA website. Uh, with all the details about the various sports. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the floating season. I know there have been some leagues that have may have already done this or talked about uh, moving a sport like girls volleyball to that floating season. Mm -hmm. Has that been a consideration in the TVL at all? It has. We actually just made that a formal uh, announcement uh, Wednesday. Um, actually, um, we're following a, another meeting between uh, the league's 12 principals and 12 athletic directors. Uh, we talked a lot uh, about volleyball and um, due to the nature of being indoors um, and schools are going to great lengths um, to limit visitors, um, to limit people into their building, right? That's why schools are going with cohort models and the every other day model. Um, and so we really felt that volleyball um, was going to be very difficult for us to maintain the safety that we're trying to employ um, for the fall season um, with the limitations of bringing people into your buildings. You know, there's a every school has significantly different sanitization um, processes put in place for the afternoons, and this would kind of throw that off um, for our maintenance and custodial staff. Um, having, you know, having people come in the building, having officials come in the building. It's a lot of people bringing them into the building, whereas all of the other sports that remain are all outdoor sports. Um, the other um, issue with volleyball is more logistical. Um, most schools, not all, but most schools right now are utilizing their gyms um, for overflow from the cafeteria for overflow for classroom space because of the six foot distancing. So I know you guys haven't been up here in a while, or at least I don't think you have. Our athletic center is covered in desks. Um, so it would be, we'd be a little bit hard pressed to uh, play volleyball uh, in there at the moment as, as well. And the recommendation that came with volleyball was that it to be played outdoors if possible. Um, which, you know, we, we're not exactly like California beach volleyball here uh, in Massachusetts. So, Obviously, that was not really a, a possibility to do it outside. So we felt that by moving it to the fall two season, it's a sport that we don't have to worry about the weather. You know, I know a lot of people are concerned about what football is going to look like in late February and, and for good reason. Um, but volleyball, that's not a concern. So if the situation improves, awesome. If it doesn't, if it stays kind of the same, then we're in the same boat that we are now. Um, so we felt that, that we didn't really lose anything by moving volleyball to that season, and we may hopefully gain uh, the ability to play it in its more normal uh, fashion. Um, so again, disappointing, certainly you, you, for any of the girls planning to get ready for their season, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to minimize the disappointment for the, for the girls, for our coaching staff, for their families, um, but we do think it was the safest decision. And, you know, having the ability to move it rather than cancel it, um, I think made the decision a little bit easier for all of us um, that we could still put that safety piece at first and foremost uh, and still also provide the opportunity for everybody. So, so we have moved volleyball as a league to fall to um, few it, earlier this week, one league uh, actually moved their entire fall one season to fall to. Um, and you may see other leagues choose to do that as well, uh, especially after they digest these modifications. Uh, but that is not a plan that, that we are looking at in the TVL. We are trying to play what sports we are able to, that we feel that we can do so in a safe manner. Right. Um, and again, each league's a little different as well, right? We have hot spots in Massachusetts where there's a lot of communities in the red. You know, So if you took the TVL and seven of our communities were in the red, well, then maybe it would make sense to move everything to fall two because we weren't going to be able to play anyone anyway. 
<laughs> right. Um, but you know, luckily we're not in that that situation right now, so we're able to still move forward with a with a plan. So overall, it's really a league decision as to what sports they want to move to that fall two season. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, every decision is an individual district decision. Um, but where we're going with a geographic and league based schedule, you know, if we for some reason and again, logistically, this does not apply to Hopkinton. I don't think we could safely or logistically operate a volleyball program, certainly not the way we would want to operate it. Um, but let's say we did, for argument's sake, we wanted to push forward with volleyball, we wouldn't have any contests, right? So that's why it is important as a league to kind of be on the same page because, yeah, you could maybe reach out to Westboro or Shrewsbury or, or whoever, but we all talk. So even though we might not be in the same league, every league is doing the same thing. You know, I don't know any leagues that are playing non-league games or matches. Um, people are keeping it very much many leagues have broken up within their leagues into smaller pods um, to, to make this all work. Um, and so I think we do have to be mindful of what works best for Hopkinton, but also w what works, you know, as a collective group within the TVL. And, and Mike, I know you had a question before. Well, no, I was just, I was just going to go with, uh, you brought up a great point on the cleaning of the school and where Hopkinton is like one of the few schools, you didn't really have to go through the school to get to the athletic center. And whereas a lot of other schools, their athletic centers or gyms have a public entrance, mm -hmm. you know, that basically limits you from the rest of the school. So that's something that a lot of people don't think about was how, because I'm sure you're going to let some of the public come for these games. And you're going to find that, you know, if there was a, a door that walked right into athletic center, yeah, you bring them in there and then the rest of the school can be shut down for the uh, proper de decon that it wants to do. Um, but where you don't have that, that that's a great point to bring up about, you know, it's not just the sport. You've got the whole school that you're dealing with. Right. You know, and again, you know, big factor is where, you know, the whole, you know, when you talk to everybody, whether it's the reopening of school or it's phasing back into restaurants and businesses opening, it's all about reducing, in, um, you know, reducing our exposure to other people. And um, again, you know, the guidance so far has been that outside obviously is, is the best course of action um, and, and the, it does not spread quite as rapidly uh, in outdoor activities. So uh, with safety, again, being the number one priority, we felt like it was, you know, being indoors um, and sort of the unknown aspect of that, bringing students from another school into our building. Because right now, if we host a school in soccer or field hockey, they can come dressed, ready to go and go out to the field and they don't ever have to come in the building Custodians don't have to worry about an extra area to clean. We don't have to worry about, oh, did that student from another school pass one of our students and he ended up being infected and now trying to contact trace that. It just becomes a, a very difficult process to navigate. By keeping things outside, it really does help us uh, in, in that aspect. And, and I also can't underscore that, you know, as a school, our first priority is, is getting students back into the building safely. And, and in many cases, using the gym for alternative means is a way to do that. Um, and, and that's unfortunate that we're not going to be able to use our athletic center right now the way we really want to use it. Um, right. but, but we need to put the focus where it should be, which is on the academics, uh, having a, um, a safe space, space for students to eat their lunch, because um, that's another way that the athletic center is being used. Um, you know, schools are not built for distancing. You know, they're, they're really not. I mean, they're built to cram people in. And, you know, it's about interaction. It's about putting everyone together. And, you know, so when a school has to all of a sudden totally reprogram itself and rewire itself, it's like, you know, and even part of it was to, to, to make our classrooms conform to the six feet spacing guidelines. We had to take a lot of stuff out, desks, bookshelves, et cetera. Where does that go? We don't have any storage for that stuff. Um, so a lot of it is in is in schools gyms, unfortunately. Um, so not only do we have desks set up, we also have a lot of storage in there uh, as well. So um, th there's a lot of there was again there was a lot of deliberation that went into that, um, but I do think it was the, the right decision. 
Absolutely. And uh, it's just such a transition for everyone uh, to, to, as you say, pretty much make schools a place where people could socially distance when they're certainly not meant for that uh, purpose. Uh, but you all have done a great job coming up with a plan to uh, get the kids back into school and, of course, uh, back on the athletic fields. Uh, one thing that um, a lot of people I'm sure are wondering about is, is there going to be fans allowed it, or are there some restrictions, no fans? What's the situation with the uh, fans? So we're still talking about that on a, on a district level and a league level. It's certainly a, a major conversation. Um, at a minimum, there's restrictions. I mean, there's restrictions that we have to follow um, in terms of the total number of people allowed at an outside gathering. Um, there's social contact uh, requirements for any sort of gathering, and we would fall into that as well. Um, so there's a lot that goes into uh, the spectator piece. Uh, certainly as a parent myself, um, <laughs> you know, I, I fully appreciate that parents want to be able to come and watch the, their kids play. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, so this is a difficult decision for all of us. Um, you know, I can't speak for all the principals and athletic directors, but I think the overwhelming majority of us are parents. Uh, so trust me, we're, we're looking at this from, from, a, from a variety of lenses, but we definitely have at a minimum, there are guidelines in terms of the sheer numbers of people that are allowed. Um, but then there's those other pieces about masks, social distancing, contact tracing, um, and things of that nature that we're still trying to navigate. Um, and again, that's something we're trying to look at as a league. Uh, we feel like it's very consistent um, that if we're going to be holding contests that we can't have, you know, Hopkinson's like, yeah, we'll have people come, but we can't have people or we're only allowing 10 people. We're allowing 50 people. Like we really feel that it's important to be um, consistent. So um, this is something that we're still kind of working on, um, you know, both within our own community and, and as a league to, to come up with something that's going to work. And it's not going to be perfect. People aren't going to be happy. Um, right. You know, I, but I will tell you as a, as a parent, the one thing I keep going back to is if my option was my son or daughter could play and I can't watch or they can't play at all, then I would take them playing and me not being able to watch. Um, you know, my son's soccer team has started a couple of weeks ago and um, we are not allowed to get out of our cars. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's not enjoyable to sit in a car for, you know, an hour and 15 minutes uh, while they practice, but I'm just happy he's out there. Um, you, you know, doing something and playing with his, with his teammates. So um, again, is it perfect? Would I rather be out there? Would I rather even be socializing with the parents? You know, that's also something for us to be able to chat on the sidelines, right? So, um, but I'd still take him playing over where we were this spring. So uh, these are the things that we got to kind of navigate um, through a little bit. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll be... Uh, probably hitting you guys up to see what you guys can live stream for us as well as we, as we move through this process. Well, one thing that's been in the back of my mind is live streaming uh, now is going to be more important than ever. So, yeah, yeah. And we'll certainly uh, help you in that department. Well, thank uh, you. you guys are always great with, uh, with our athletic teams for sure. Uh, yeah, we, but, we, we enjoy it. The volunteers love coming out. We love it. That's one of the big things that we've missed this whole time. You know, even we had doing shows like this, normally we'd have you in the studio sitting around a table. Right. But everything's been like this, and I, 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 I mean, all my all our camera operators, all our directors, all our graphic, everybody is, it, you know, we miss seeing it. That's that's why I took this job on is to work with volunteers, and now it's like I'm working at home. Oh, trust me, it's a great point. You say taking that job. I mean, taking an athletic director job to not have sports was not really in the equation. So, um, <laughs> you know, so we're we're hoping to get you know get the students back out there, and and I know if you talk to really any teacher, coach, administrator, uh, the thing we all miss. I mean, we all miss the social interaction professionally, but we miss the kids. I mean, it's been oh, so yeah. weird. I've, I've had some Zooms with, with, with students over the spring, but um, I mean, it's just so weird to go this long, um, you know, without, without interacting with students. It, it's just, uh, it'll be refreshing um, once, once we get going again, even so, if it is with a mask on, we'll take it. Yeah. So, so like you said, the uh, MIA came out with their uh, rules and, and guidelines for uh, playing sports during COVID, which you will digest over the weekend. And we're going to help you uh, get a little head start on that today as we pick through it and ask you some questions because, uh, you know, we, we want to try to get what 
your thought was on it or how the decision you think was made and and so forth. But let's before we get started, what can we see starting in September in hockey? So we are hoping again. Things could change tomorrow, right? I mean, we're all, we all know in this. So as, as this of this moment, in time. but as of this moment, we are hoping to um, offer um, cross country, golf, um, boys and girls soccer, and field hockey. Um, again, the the three sports were moved automatically for us, um, as Tom had mentioned earlier, in football, cheer, and unified basketball, due to their classification as a high risk sport. Um, and then uh, we as a league made the decision to move volleyball again for, for additional safety reasons. Sure. Um, but the, the remainder of the sports we offer, again, there's some other sports there on the graphic that, that you showed, Tom. Um, like I think of gymnastics and swimming. Um, you know, we do offer those programs. We're, we're in a co-op with Westboro for gymnastics and we do offer swimming, but those are winter sports for us. Um, there are some sports that are offered in, in multiple seasons. Uh, and some of that has to do with um, facility use. So sometimes leagues will do swimming in the fall and other leagues will do swimming in the, in the winter. And part of the reason for that is just a lack of facilities. You know, many of us share the same pools. There's, there's really not a lot of pools out there, believe it or not, that, that can uh, hold a high school swim team uh, right. and to, to hold our events and our practices. So that's one of the reasons why you'll see that some sports are played in multiple seasons. Um, and sometimes it's just a gender breakdown as well. Uh, like some, something like golf in the fall as well as girls golf in the spring. But um, so the, the other sports that we do offer, we are planning to, to move forward with um, in this fall. Well, I'm no scientist or doctor, but I guess the good thing that could be about swimming is the chlorine uh, for the most part would kill everything, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, I think swimming and, and diving is an interesting one because in some ways there's some built in distance um, in the lanes. Um, but if you've ever seen our swim team, we have, uh, far more kids than there are lanes, right? And so oftentimes they're in the same lane and they're passing by each other uh, when they're doing their workouts. And if you've ever been to a swim meet, um, you know, the, the students are, are all along the pool deck um, and then the locker room situation as well. So, so each sport, you know, brings with it its own circumstances that we'll need to navigate. Um, and we're certainly willing to do what we need to, to to get these sports the chance to play. But I have a feeling that most sports will not look like they normally do, at least for, for the 2020, 21, you know, school year. Um, but, but hopefully we can get through them all uh, one way or the other. And with a, nice. with a sport like swimming, um, thinking about uh, what you just said about kind of limiting the amount of people coming in close contact, is that perhaps a sport where you could end up having something like split meets or limits to the amount of uh athletes that are allowed to go to the meet? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I think one of the negatives that we could run into is uh, a big part of our job is creating opportunities, not trying to limit opportunities. But in order to make some of these opportunities a reality, we may in turn need to limit participation to conform to the guidelines, right? So that is a catch-22 that we're kind of facing right now. And how do we do this? <laughs> You're right. We, we want to make sure people have the chance, but only some of you. I mean, it's a little yeah. bit of a mixed message. Um, but we're, we're bound by these, um, you know, guidelines that were given by the state uh, that we have to follow. So uh, it is it is a little bit tricky to navigate. That's a really good question, Tom. And um, it's something that we are dealing with, you know, uh, even for the fall season. Uh, in, in some cases, you know, you can't have 100 kids running across country race at the same time and distance. <laughs> right. right. It's, it's, it's not possible. So these are all things that we have to try to get creative with on, on how we can make things happen. I know one of the things I've heard about cross country is there's been some thought of pretty much really separating the athletes. And instead of having them race, they, you know, would run up the track or run the course and then they would just obviously be timed and they would take those times and determine the best one is something like that, a possibility uh, for this cross country season that's upcoming. So, I mean, I guess everything's a possibility, right. but, um, you know, certainly we're going to try to make it as, as um, traditional as we can. I think one of the, one of the major differences between cross co running cross country and running events and track, right. Is the, is the cross country component, the being outside, being on a trail. Um, I think that's vastly different than running, you know, a 5k on a track. So, um, those are things we're going to try to keep as traditional as we possibly can, you know, using staggered starts, um, you know, pr you know, probably needing a few more timers 
um, so that maybe we start kids at different points along the race, but if they can obviously still complete the entire race. Um, but at the same time, cross country courses by nature get generally very narrow at certain points. Um, and, you know, for us, um, one of the, one of the, the negatives is, uh, that we already knew about going into this was that we were not going to be able to use our traditional home course, right? Hopkinton state park is where we traditionally run our home meets. Um, but under the current restrictions, you are not allowed to run races of any kind, um, in state parks. Oh. So that's not unique to Hopkinton. That's anyone that uses a state park. You're not able to reserve it, you know, cause we have to file a permit, um, in order to be able to reserve that, that, that area for our races. Um, and so you're not able to get permits for that purpose right now. So, uh, at a minimum, we were already looking at changing our course. Um, we had held off on making any decisions until we saw what the modifications were. So now we'll start that process of what can we use for a course that aligns with the modifications that we've been given. Um, and we have a little bit of time to do that. So, um, you know, I'm still very hopeful that, that we'll make it work. Don't get me wrong. But we, we knew going in that we were not going to be able to use Hopkinton State Park. If we were allowed to have a season, we knew it was going to be on a different course. Um, right. So uh, we did know about that kind of going into this. Uh, and there, there must, oh, go ahead, Mike. Well, I, I was just going to say there must be a number of schools with that same problem because uh, I'm sure a few of them use uh, a state course. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, absolutely. Mike? I mean, they, they, I mean it's beautiful. If, you've, if anyone's ever been over to Hopkinton, uh, I mean, Hopkinton State Park is beautiful to begin with, but, um, you know, where, where the teams run is, it, it, first of all, it's beautiful, but it's also right. great for spectators. Um, to be able to see the race, they can kind of move along and see them at various points in the race, um, where a lot of courses just kind of go in the woods and you really can't see them. And then all of a sudden they come on, you're like, oh, he or she's winning the race. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, it actually, you know, it's a lot of parking over there as well. Um, so there's a lot of benefits for us in, in using that course. Um, and it's, you know, so that's just one of the other unfortunate pieces to this puzzle. But, uh, you know, hopefully we're still going to be able to provide the experience, you know, just in a, in a, in a different way. So I wanted to uh, break it down to some sports and you just mentioned cross country. I'm going to talk soccer, but all your teams from uh, reading the MIA guidelines has to come up with a COVID coach. You don't know yeah. anything about that. Uh, we did not, um, you know, we did not know that that was going to be a, you know, um, sort of specified the way it was. I actually have that right here. This yeah. There you go. Yeah. Coach. Uh, that was the, it's on the first page. Uh, yeah. Um, but one of the things I will tell you, Mike, is although we weren't calling the person a COVID coach, um, we've been looking into ways to try to utilize assistance and potentially even hire more assistance, uh, not just to be the COVID coach, but just to make sure that we are providing a safe environment. And the more supervision and the more coaches you have, the better you're able to break them down into, into smaller groups, right? So again, we're doing a lot of things that are with that safety lens in, in, in mind. I mean, I'll give you a very simple example. Kids usually use, you know, right? The pennies, right? Yeah. The gross pennies that, that, yeah. you know, typically smell horrific and you put it on and you're like, Oh, it's like crunchy. You wash them at, you wash yeah. them at the start of every season. Never yeah. see the wash just, again. And then you just throw it in a pile and you, you take it the next day. And then you put in someone else's sweat on the next day. It's delightful. We're not doing that this year. Right. So uh, I was able to purchase um, numbered pennies. So, you know, every student that makes the team will actually receive, that will be their penny to wear at practice, you know, every day. So there are simple things you can do, you know, to limit the sharing of, of equipment and in this case, the, the pennies. Um, you know, so th there is a lot of thought that we've done. So my hope is that, although I haven't had a chance to read through all this, we've, we've hopefully already addressed a decent amount of the things that we're required to do, like the COVID coach. Uh, right. Again, I, I'm not going to, call someone that i don't think i don't i don't know that anyone wants to be referred to as the i know the nfl has the um get back coach right yeah. the, the one that has yeah. to constantly yell at the coach to get off the field and the players to get off the field um yeah. you know so I, I guess this will be our version of the of the get back coach um but you'll you know whatever we end up being able to do i you know i'm one of the things you'll definitely see is you'll see this the kids on the sidelines six feet apart with cones Right. Um, you know, all those things, those things will definitely be happening. And those are things that we've already, you know, discussed. Um, so, again, I think in, I'm sure there's some things in here that we maybe haven't thought about yet and that we're going to need to address. 
Um, but but I am optimistic that we've we've taken most of this into account because, you know, if you use the EEA guidelines that we saw over the summer, um, although this latest version was a little bit more restrictive, um, you know, I think I think we to some extent knew what was coming. You know, we didn't know the support by sport modifications per se, uh, right. but I think we knew what some of the safety modifications, you know, were going to be. And uh, one sport that I've been uh, reading about uh, is soccer. And there certainly seems to be a, a lot of differences uh, with mm-hmm. with the soccer plan. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty much it appears that uh, whenever players get close to each other, there's going to be a stoppage and a free kick. And uh, there's going to be no slide tackling allowed or anything like that. But I guess the impression I got from it was it was going to be a lot kind of like field hockey. Whenever you, you get two players getting close to each other, there's a stoppage. Um, I'm getting that impression um, from this soccer plan. Uh, what are your thoughts about the soccer plan? And have you heard any feedback from coaches or uh, soccer players? So I have not had a chance. Like I said, I actually was, was, was in a meeting um, and then the modifications came out um, and then I had another phone call and then I was getting on here. So I basically got as far as printing them out. What I will say is for the soccer modification, I had seen the mass youth soccer guidelines that came out maybe about a week or so ago. And so when those came out, um, and, and I would imagine they're probably pretty similar to the mass, mass youth soccer guidelines in terms of the contact rules, um, I haven't looked, but I, I know the throw-in was probably being eliminated um, and turned into yes. a to a kick. Um, no walls, right? You, you can't create a traditional wall. You can't kick into the box. Again, I don't know if this is all in there or not. Um, the need to wear masks, um, all of those things, we, we kind of thought were coming. So what I did was I, I spoke with both of our head coaches, uh, Coach Skiba for the girls and Coach Sawyer for the boys. And I, I was curious their thoughts when those mass youth guidelines came out. Um, if they had had any interaction with their players and families at all um, to, to kind of get a sense, what did they think? You know, in, in essence, would you want to play if these were the rules or would you want to kick it to fall too? And I can't speak for everyone by any means, but I think the general consensus that I got from speaking to them. Um, and again, I plan to speak to, to, to more of our coaching staff and to more of our players as well over the coming days is to get a sense of how they feel. Um, but the sense I got is that people are just craving something. And even right. though this isn't, this drastically changes the game of soccer. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I think people are just craving being part of a team, having something to do. And the reality is, is if we move it to fall two, there's no guarantee that these modifications are not eliminated. And then you're also trying to figure out what kind of fields would you be playing on? Um, So I I think the general consensus I got is it's not going to be easy to reprogram players who have for years headed the ball, slide tackled, um, you know, worked on set plays. You know, many teams, that's how they score in soccer. They, (laughs) you know, they score off of set pieces. And, you know, so it's going to be drastically different for teams. Um, it's going to be drastically different for officials. Um, oh, certainly. <laughs> I mean, I think the one advantage I will say for officials, and, and I, you know, I, I don't condone people yelling at officials ever. Um, it, it, I, I actually can't stand it. Um, but I think in this case, I would like to think people would be even more understanding. I mean, these officials are going to have no time to adjust and learn these rules either. So they're going to be doing the best they can to make sure kids are safe. And I think, again, if you go back to an earlier thing you mentioned, you know, we're not having league champions. We're not having state tournaments. Um, so yes, the players are going to play to win. I, I know that, right? I was an athlete. You play to win. When you step on the field, you play to win. So I'm not saying that that's not going to happen, but you're not going to have someone worrying about if their call costs someone a playoff game or cost them a league championship or something to that effect, right? It's just going to be a game by game situation. So yeah, I mean, it's going to be tough for officials. It's going to be tough for coaches. It's going to be tough for the players. I really think the reprogramming of players is going to be a challenge. And and, and I'm sure, unfortunately, and I, I really mean this, unfortunately, instead of working at soccer on, on the things that you would typically do to help them improve individually and collectively, you're actually going to have to, coaches are now going to have to take a lot of time to teach them how to really not play soccer. 
<laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's kind of a weird, um, you know, it's a weird situation to be in and, and we'll see what happens. Like I said, I'm going to be taking feedback from, from, from our, you know, the groups of people, the constituents that are directly impacted by this uh, to see if we want to make any changes to our plan, which again is right now to move forward with soccer. Um, but certainly it's going to be a different game. Um, you know, the only thing I could say is it's going to be level, right? I mean, everyone's got to be play, play by these rules. Everyone needs to adjust to these rules. At the end of the day, it's for the safety and well-being uh, of everyone involved. Um, I know there'll be people who don't agree with the rules. Um, and, and But at the end of the day, we need to abide by them. Uh, you know what right. I mean? We need to do um, what's been put in, put in front of us. And we have some of the rules up on the screen so mm -hmm. the viewers could see. Uh, but, yeah, it'll certainly be a different game. But um, I would imagine that the athletes will just be excited to get out there. And it's usually nice weather in those September and October months as well for the most part. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to get uh, back out there. But as you said, it's going to just be such a transition for the coaches and for the officials uh, to get used to this. And I think everybody will have to have some understanding for that. And uh, certainly with all these uh, rule changes and crazy circumstances, I think uh, the last thing anyone should do is uh, criticize any official uh, uh, because it'll certainly be adjustment for all of us. Um, so have you, you mentioned your son plays soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, so have you seen any of these new rules implemented in the soccer that he is playing, if you don't mind me asking. So the most significant rules that we've seen so far. So at, at, when he first started playing, um, so he plays on a um, on a club soccer team. Um, he's younger. He's a little bit younger than the high, you know high school kids and so forth. But um, the, the the first few weeks of practice, and they were just doing. They actually don't typically start this early. I think that honestly, they felt bad because they lost out on the spring season. So they threw some practices together. And what was hard at those first couple practices was. The, you couldn't do any competitive drills at that time. If you remember, soccer was initially considered high risk. Right. And then it was moved to moderate risk. So those first few practices um, where they could only do drills where they um, were distanced from each other, um, either a passing drill or footwork drill, um, was interesting, you know, because one of the things that I think my son loves and I think most people love is the competitive drills, the one-on-one -on -one drills, two-on-two -two drills, little scrimmages at the end of practice, you know, things like that. And they couldn't do those. Now they can, but the biggest thing that I've seen that, that I'm not going to lie has been a challenge for him personally is wearing a mask the entire training. Um, it's hot. Um, and, you know, and hopefully as we move into the fall, the heat will subside a little bit. Um, there was a practice last week where it was, you know, it was mid to high 80s, um, even at five o'clock at night when he was practicing. And that was tough. You could see all the kids struggling out there. And I thought the coaches, to their credit, did a great job uh, giving them a lot of consistent water breaks and understanding the situation. And it's not easy for the coaches. They're all right. wearing masks as well. Um, and they're trying to yell instructions to the kids. And they're, you know, they're, they're really hot in the mask as well. Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot of pieces to this that are going to be drastically different. Um, and again, I, I don't want to speak for everyone, but the sense that I, that I've, you know, and the feedback that I've received so far is, yes, this is going to alter all, not just soccer, it's going to alter everything. Right. And, but the general idea is let's play what we can while we can. Um, exactly. and, and I don't want to be pessimistic by any means, but I think everyone knows at the back of their head, we don't know how far we're going to get. We don't know what's going to happen with COVID. Um, I certainly hope that schools reopen smoothly. I, I hope athletics, we were able to play all four seasons. Um, but I think everyone is realistic enough to know we're not quite sure what's going to happen. No one right. knows. And I think we're all a little bit hypersensitive to that after what happened in the spring. Um, and I think if you ask those spring athletes, if they could have done anything, they would have taken anything <laughs> right. over, over not having something. And I think that's fresh in people's minds. And that's why people are willing to do this, even though it, it's a totally different sport. And I think particularly for those, young men and women that are potentially moving on to play at the college level, this is going to impact them as well. Um, you know, so um, it, it's difficult. It's, it's it is. you know, it's just a tricky situation. It's not perfect. Um, as we've said, you know, many, many times, but, you know, I'm hoping we can make the best out of the situation. And from my point of view, we're still hopefully getting the students out there, um, exercising, competing, 
And really, to me, the most important thing is that being with their team, they're being part of a team, they're being with them. Um, you know, they're learning the same concepts of perseverance, adversity, sportsmanship, hard work, all the things that we love about sports and those lessons that you take the rest of your way, they're still going to learn those. Uh, and they might even learn a, a little bit more adversity uh, and perseverance um, in, in terms of, of, of overcoming these obstacles and these challenges. So I think there's still more positives um, than negatives. I guess they're, they're, what they're most going to learn is how to transition to a different situation. But you brought up a good point about the face mask. And this is something I've thought a bit about. Some of these days, it is really hot out there. And there must be a bit of a concern with having the athletes have to wear those face masks, especially in a sport like soccer, where there's a lot of running involved. Mm -hmm. Has there been any consideration as far as more timeouts, more stoppages uh, during the games? So I believe, and, and again, I haven't seen this, but I, I happen to see it on, on Twitter because that's where I, it's the best place to get news. Right. Um, <laughs> Uh, I did see some information on Twitter um, that had started to come out last night, so I don't know if it's 100% accurate or not uh, because I haven't read this, but I believe that soccer was moving to quarters. I don't know if you saw that in there at all. Um, I believe they were moving to quarters. Um, to, again, you've seen, if anyone has watched, you know, um, you know, the Premier League and some of those leagues, they're, they're now taking water breaks as well um, and things like that they don't normally do where they stop the game and, and allow everyone to get a drink. Um, so those are things that we might have to look at. Um, we have a heat policy that we need to abide by anyway. Um, mm -hmm. again, as we move into mid September, the heat policy does not typically come into play as much as it does, you know, during the preseason, you know, when we get started in August. Um, but we do have heat guidelines that regulate, um, whether you're allowed to play a contest, you know, whether you're allowed to practice and how many water breaks you need to give within an hour span. Um, so there's some of that that's dictated for us, but I'm going to be honest. I have all the confidence in the world that our coaches will make sure that if they're, they're either subbing more regularly or at practice, they're providing water breaks more regularly. Um, you know, I have no doubt that, that we're going to make sure that, that everyone is okay. Um, and like anything else, I hate to say it. Um, you know, we, I don't know that everyone agrees with me, but when I first started to wear a mask, uh, it was a tough adjustment. Um, but now I, I, I'm so used to wearing a mask. I have it on sometimes for hours at a time, and I, I don't even notice it anymore. Um, I coached my son's baseball team over the summer, and I had to wear a mask the entire time. You just – so my hope, and I'm not saying it's going to be easy, and I'm not trying to minimize it, but I'm hoping that the, the students will get used to, you know, used to playing with a mask on. Um, right. But it's, it's not going to be easy, especially on those hot days. Oh, yeah, and it does uh, take some getting – used to, uh, especially for myself, uh, when, whenever you go to a public place, uh, I have this issue of forgetting my mask and I have to go back home and get it. It's certainly, uh, not a whole lot of fun, but, um, I, I'm right. So the, earlier today I was dry. I, I had to go pick something up, um, at one of our vendors and I was about 20 minutes on my way there and I realized I forgot a mask. And so I had to drive home, get my mask and then drive back. So, I mean, I lost about 45 minutes of my day. Um, but it's my own fault. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely something that we're all still getting used to to some extent. And highlighted here, I do uh, have uh, the soccer rule that it will be quarters, mm -hmm. two minute break between quarters. Halftime uh, will last uh, for 10 minutes. And I'm sure there'll be uh, multiple stoppages as well throughout those quarters as needed, especially on those hot days. Right. Uh, but yeah, it all takes uh, some getting used to. There'll be some different rules and uh, a lot of differences in some cases, but it's great to uh, get the kids back out there playing. Uh, and uh, just one last thing, you mentioned that right now the athletic center, it's being used for class space and used for cafeteria space. Uh, is that going to be the case in the winter? Will it be available uh, for those winter sports? Uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I do believe our district values um, athletics. Um, so I think if, if we're still in similar situation with, with um, our hybrid model, um, but we also have the ability to play winter sports, um, I'm fully confident that we'll come up with a plan um, that works. Well, uh, Rich, uh, we're certainly looking forward to the, having some sports very soon, and we hope that everything runs smoothly, but it will certainly be a wait-and-see situation. Thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Take it easy, guys.
That'll wrap it up for the Hangout Hour. For everyone at HCAM, I'm Tom Nappy. Enjoy your weekend, folks, and thanks for tuning in. <laughs> <laughs>